All right, let's have prayer, and you eat, and I'll teach. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. I thank you for these that have come with us by the automobile and the Internet. I pray today as we look at the geography of the ancient world, we would have an opportunity to see what changes have been made and trust God for all of the changes that have made to the post-Diluvian period in which we live. And it will be the period that takes us all the way to the millennium. Uh, and I pray, Father, that you would help us understand the significance of your faithfulness. Your faithfulness to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in Genesis, the second chapter, verses 8 through 14, which we read, which gives us the only genealogy, uh, the only geography of the ancient world ever recorded is in the Bible. If it wasn't for the Bible, we would not know anything about the period prior to our civilization, the post diluvian period. We would know nothing because nobody has that. And so the Bible becomes an enormous resource for us on ancient history. At a certain point, you have to go to the Bible because there's no more, nothing. Human history just goes to a certain point uh, of the historian writers and if you don't believe in the Bible, then you don't, you're going to stop. The best you can do is the post diluvian period. The rest, you don't have to guess about it. The, the Bible's an accurate book. You don't have to guess about it. And so we're going to look at that because you would never get to study this in school or college or any place else unless they taught the Bible and taught this specific subject. And so this is a categorical doctrine of the geography of the antediluvian world recorded in the Bible. So let's look at four things. First thing that ought to be called to our attention is that there are seven different biblical geographies of the world. Seven. The first one that's recorded in the Bible in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2, is the original creation before the fall of Satan. The second one is the restoration of creation before the fall of Adam, recorded in Genesis 1, 3 through the second chapter, verse 7. The third period is the Garden of Eden, which is kind of just the most unique thing you could ever think about, which was before and after the fall of Adam. It's recorded. And how it was changed when they were expelled from the garden. That whole part of history is gone. That's recorded in Genesis 2, 8 through the third chapter, verse 24. The uh, next period is the antediluvian geography, which we're studying, that's recorded from Genesis 4, 1 to 9, 28. We're looking at that ourselves. This was, <clears throat> this was before the flood, Noah's flood, what we call Noah's flood. <clears throat> the post-diluvian geography was changed dramatically by the flood. That's the period in which we live. That's our historical period. And this will hold true until the second coming of Christ when this too will be dramatically changed uh, due to his second coming. Then we have the millennial period, which is unique in itself. During this period, the Adamic curse upon the earth recorded in Genesis 3 uh, will be removed from the earth until the end of that period when it will be, the uh, earth will be renovated or destroyed by fire. You can read about that in Isaiah 11, 6, 65, 25, Revelation 20, 2 Peter 3rd chapter 4 through 9. Those of you that are at home somewhere or in some place of the world and you think I'm going too fast, that's probably so. We have an hour for lunch here, but you can pick up our notes off from doctrinalstudies.com. You go there sometime during this week, later in the week, and you should be able to pull down everything I'm reading. But in the meantime, you ought to, you ought to write some. Our final, the final geography is, is going to be the new heaven and new earth described in Revelation 21 through 22 and 2 Peter 3rd chapter 10 through 14, the new heaven and new earth. It's described also in the Old Testament to some degree. 
So when you look, when you try to see what is the geography of the Bible, you run into these, these seven different uh, biblical ge ge uh, geographics of the world. Now, my second point, looking at the specific of the antediluvian civilization, uh, it, it is interesting because it's made up of six geographical places. That's all we know about is what's been described. For example, we understand Eden. When you read about Eden in the second chapter, verse 8 and verse 15, there's always a reference to the east. The east. And that, that's kind of important. Havilah is a place that's described in the second chapter, verse 11. If you know anything about Greek mythology, this place is mentioned with the golden fleece, if you remember anything about that in Greek mythology. Uh, Ishmael, in Isaiah, uh, in Genesis 25, verses 17 and 18, went there, as well as Hagar. It's interesting when you read the 36th chapter, verse 19. None of this is on your paper, by the way. Esau, when he was looking, when Esau was looking for a bride, he married one of the daughters of Ishmael. And they were known as Edomites, which is known like uh, we're no, known as Americans. An Edomite, it, they were named by their section where they lived. Cush was another geographical location. The second chapter, verse 13. Uh, most, some of these names were carried over like the next one here, was carried over, apparently, carried over from the ark with Noah. And the geographics of some similarity was identified. And the only way we know about that, and most historic, biblical historians believe, that it was due to the, the two rivers that fed it, the Tigris and Euphrates. Nod is kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's, recorded, it's recorded in the fourth chapter, verse 16, and that should be Cain. I, I, it's a C-I-N, but it should be, there should be an A in it. It was located east of Eden, the best we know, based on the fourth chapter, verse 16. Uh, when Cain murdered Abel, that's where he was sent to. Now, Mount Eret, that's recorded in the 7th chapter, verse 20, and the 8th chapter, verse 4, the ark came to rest on this mountain. Now, at least looking back the post-Diluvian period to the mountain on which that ark rested, it seemed to be if not the highest mountain, one of the highest mountains, even today after the flood, it's over 17,000 feet. Uh, the problem, a problem with the any mountain in the antediluvian period to the post-diluvian period, it could well be underwater. After the flood, the first dramatic change that occurred was 71% of the earth was underwater. And 97% of the water was salt water. That's the world in which we live. Five oceans separated seven continents. 
of the landmass of the post diluvian civilization. That was not true in the antediluvian world. Now, to try to understand why would God, why would God separate us into seven continents with five oceans separating us, that certainly wasn't true in the antediluvian world. They only had two continents. And they had no oceans. I mean, God knows the difference between an ocean and a river. But these rivers must have been something. But two of them, which we'll see in a moment, flowed around. When you have that doing that, you have a continent. So that's kind of interesting. Listen, you say, well, Ron, is there any explanation to why God would separate all of them like that? Yeah. The answer is found in Genesis 10 and 11. Now, we're not going to study that. But the answer is found in Genesis 10 and 11. And listen to me. The biggest thing is Matthew 24. 37 through 39, you know what that says? Listen to me now. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. That's the answer to that. That's another part of that, that why did he do that? And I'll tell you, we, we looked at it the last time. It's because of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We're told to go and disciple all what? Nations. And, and that's worldwide, isn't it? To do that, we, we go to seven continents and, and travel, tra travel five oceans. Well, now we got airplanes. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of interesting. Just kind of interesting to me. Now, these five rivers, this is, this is how... This is the water supply they had. The five rivers are recorded supplying the water for the antediluvian civilization. Be sure to note the two continents. The first river flows out of the east of Eden, according to Genesis 2, 8, and 10. It watered the Garden of Eden and then divided into four rivers that supplied the rest of the antediluvian world. Where did this water come from? Listen to me. We get a really good clue in the 7th chapter, verse 11, when we found out that there was a reservoir of water underneath. You remember? That was opened up and flooded the earth from the bottom side. Remember that? And then the rain from the top came down. Mm. That would be a, a clue to us. That would be helpful for us. Pashan, one of the rivers, Pashan, flowed around the whole land of Havilah. That makes that a continent in our terms. Gihon, the other river, another river, flowed around the land of Cush in the Genesis 2.13. That made that a continent. The Tigris flowed around Assyria, and Euphrates is simply called the fourth divided river in Genesis 2.14. So these must have been pretty phenomenal. And what you realize is that the majority of the mass of the earth that's underwater now was inhabited. The 71% of the earth that wasn't, right, is now underwater. He's underwater. And so the post-Diluvian civilization expanded. This is the world we live in today after the flood, the post-Diluvian the, after the flood. We have five oceans. We have a lot of rivers. We have creeks. We have lakes. 
You know, I come from a state, Michigan, that's just got tons of lakes. We got tons of lakes. We're not really known for it. I think uh, many uh, Minnesota is known for it. It's like the land of 40,000 lakes or something. But we have, a, I have no idea, but we've got, everybody's got a lake. I mean, we, we've got Lake Michigan, and then we got, I lived on Stony Lake and Bear Lake, and we got all, Muskegon Lake, just where I grew up. I mean, we had lakes, lakes, I tell you, two things that we had a lot of in Michigan when I was a kid, we had a lot of lakes on a lot of golf courses. <laughs> I, I don't know how that goes together, and, but anyhow, uh, seven continents, we have seven continents, there's the five oceans that separate the continents up. 71% of the land mass today is underwater, but we have a rainbow. Isn't that wonderful? I hope, you, I hope when you see a rainbow that you have a, a warm glow inside your soul because it tells you God is faithful. God is always faithful to your life, both in time and eternity. It always reminds us, at least to, to believers who know the importance of a rainbow, it reminds us to the faithfulness of, man, of, of, of God to mankind. And, and why is that important? Because of 2 Peter 3, 9. You know why, why, why God is faithful to mankind? So that none would perish, but all would come to repentance and salvation. When you see that rainbow, it ought to remind you to be a witness for Christ. Because it is God's desire. The rainbow is for the post-Diluvian period. They didn't have a rainbow. They did not have a rainbow in the antediluvian period. Right? <laughs> they didn't have one. It's due to the flood. And it's a sign, isn't it? It was a sign to the post-Diluvian world of God's faithfulness to mankind because he doesn't want any to perish. Just think about the antediluvian period. There were a lot of people. And only eight survived. The rest of them refused to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have studied the intensity of evil upon that generation of people. Evil. <clears throat> you know, we're actually in the middle of the eighth chapter, but I, I wanted to be sure you understood what is behind us and, and, what, uh, and why God chose to do what he did and why his concern is still about reaching a lost world because of Adam's sin, which began, that was a garden deal, right? The Garden of Eden, that whole deal. That was the garden deal. Well, we'll read more, read more about God's faithfulness when we get to the rainbow in the ninth chapter, 12 through 17. You know, when I, when I look at the antediluvian world and the flood and, and all of that, and then I look at the post-diluvian world, the one thing that brings me great confidence is this. God never changes. He never changes. Now, he may, he may cause things around your life to change, and if he does, it's for better, not for worse, Pam. Amen. It's for better, not for worse. It's never for worse. It's always for better. And one of the great lessons that I learned from this, from the post-Diluvian period, looking back to the antediluvian period, is that God never changes. When, when the Bible says God does not change, he's what? What's one of the characteristics of God? He does not change. He's immutable. God is immutable. It's one of the characteristics of God that, that make the word of God so important to our life because it's not going to change, and God ain't going to change either. These, these are two stables in our life. God is faithful. When he says he is faithful, he is faithful. And, and what a wonderful thing that is. You know, during the, during the post-Diluvian period, we should be reminded that God is still the creator and man is still the gardener. Right? We're the gardener of the earth. Of course we should take care. We should take care of the earth as best we know how. It shouldn't be our God. You know, there is there's no mother earth. 
You know, here I am, you know, Mother Earth. But there is a father of the earth. There's no mother of it. But there is a father. And that father is still in charge of it. Nothing. Listen, he's the same guy that was in charge of the antediluvian earth, is in charge of the post-diluvian earth, and is in charge of the millennial earth, and is going to be in charge of the new heaven and new earth, right? That God is not going to change. He's going to do exactly what he's told you he's going to do. We should be mindful of that. We should really pay attention to what God says. This is who I am. You need to trust that. And, and listen, he is God Almighty. Uh, he's El Shaddai. He is El Shaddai for sure. He is God Almighty. So God is never going to change. Things around you may change, but God doesn't. And when he, when he moves the furniture in your life, it's to bring an awakening in your soul. It's to bring an awakening, a spiritual awakening. That's the only reason he moves furniture around. And listen, it may be difficult for you to see that. It was difficult for me to see it with the death of Jane. Well, how is this going to get better? How is that going to work? But I have to believe it is. It doesn't do it. You don't move furniture around in your life for no reason. It's for no reason. Listen, he's, he doesn't lie and he doesn't change. He's veracity and immutable. you got to believe that about God. Because he starts moving furniture around in your life. It could be pretty dramatic. And you've got to believe that. You've got to believe that. That's what gets you from one day to the next day. And then he begins to show it to you. As soon as you, listen, God shows you nothing apart from faith. Do you know that? Listen to me now. Listen to me. God don't show you anything apart from faith. How do I know it? Because the Bible says you walk by what? Not by. Yeah, you walk by faith, not by sight. You know, you can't be a Thomas and think you're going to get dead, Right? Well, I'm not going to believe unless I see. Well, you're never going to see then, son. You're going to be blind the rest of your life. It's a blindness you put on yourself because you won't walk by faith. We don't want to be those people. I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. I want my eyes open. I want to, I, I want to walk by faith. I don't want to walk by sight. When he moves the furniture around, you know, that's just an expression. When he walk, moves things around in your life that were stables for you, really strong stables for you, and he moves them and removes them and does that kind of stuff. Today as I said breakfast, a little couple came in. I'm bad about judging age, but they were older. I don't know if they were older than me, but they were older. And... I know I'm sitting there crying. And I go, well, what's this? What, what is this? <clears throat> and that man did such a good job with his wife. They were really up in age. And he, he got up and walked around and helped her blow her nose. And he did so many wonderful things to that little old lady that was really, I mean, she, you could tell she was, she, she was in trouble and, and they were having their day out and, and, and they were really having a day out, but you could tell that they were really struggling. And, uh, there I am, I'm sitting over there and watching all this and I'm crying and I'm going, what was this? And, and that's about God moving things in your life. Whether you're ready or not, he is. And when he's ready, you've got you've to get ready. He's, when he's ready, you've got, when he's ready to move some things, you are ready whether you accept it or not. So you might as well just try to accept it and go like, okay, this is good. So I told 
I told the girl that was wait, the lady that was waiting on me. I said, "Give me the ticket. That there's no way I can let that couple out of here." And then they they were struggling getting up. He was struggling trying to help her get up. And I thought and he was having a little a little leftover thing. And then he's got her and that. I went. So I got up and said, "Look, look. I need to help you. <laughs> can I help you get your car and?" Can I help you out here? Well, somebody's already paid. I, 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 but I'm talking about, can I get you to the car? Can I help you to do this? And, and um, he said, I really have to do this myself. And I went, yeah. Boy, do I know that. I mean, you, I mean, it's like, I don't know how many more times I'm going to have this. And I knew that. Boy, how did I know that? So, listen, God is faithful. He may move furniture around in your life. He may change your life, and he may change it pretty dramatically, at least dramatically for you. <laughs> Maybe more than your breath sometimes can take. But listen to me, he is faithful. He's always faithful. When he makes dramatical changes in his life because he's got something in store for your life, that you haven't really, you really haven't grasped yet. And a lot of it's your relationship with him. A lot of it's your relationship with him. One of the things he's trying to do is to bring you into a, a, a more closer, snug relationship with him. Uh, I talked about that Sunday where he puts that when he when when the when the Hebrew says he blesses, he's going to bless you, and he, the word barak. That's where Bob got that in Baca. That's a straight pipe of grace to your life. Boom. No interference. Nobody else is involved in it. Boom. You and him. And boy, when he does that, you know that you found favor with God. And that's a super grace capacity. You want to be that because it's great for your life in, in that stage of your life. And sometimes it's difficult to grasp it, but you need to. During the post-Diluvian post, uh, uh, civilization which you and I live in, God is still the creator and man is the gardener of uh, Genesis 2.15. God's message has never changed, and it won't today. The antediluvian world, how people get saved? A prophetic gospel. Christ is going to come, die on a cross, raised from the dead. How were we saved today? A historical gospel. Christ came. We know the hill. We know the time. We know everything. He died on that cross, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. And that's a big deal. It's called the gospel. God's message has never changed. Galatians 3.8, you ought to be familiar with that. His desire for all mankind to get saved by the grace gospel of Jesus Christ is as relevant today as has ever been. Noah didn't, listen to me, Noah didn't build the ark to save mankind from Adam's original sin. You need to read Romans 5, 12 through 21 sometime. God's salvation has always been the grace gospel of Christ. You ought to read Romans 4, 23 through 25. It would be worth your time. So why, why the ark? It wasn't to rescue the unbeliever. It was to rescue the what? The believer out of divine judgment. And that ark for you and I is Jesus Christ. Je I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you think you're going to get out of this world any other way than through the gospel of Jesus Christ and, quote, go to heaven, that ain't going to happen apart from the gospel. To be absent from a body present with the Lord, you've got to be present with the Lord here to be present with the Lord there, buddy. How am I going to get present with the Lord on this side of death? you got to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. 
The gospel is the power of God into salvation, everyone who believes. You're saved by grace through faith and that of yourself is a gift of God. You're not going to get out of here without it. <laughs> You're not going to get out of here without it. I want to show you verse 6. We quote this verse all the time. We don't realize it came from the antediluvian period. Of course, we, we talk a lot about, listen, we love the Word of God no matter what period it's in. Listen, I quote the Bible of a period way ahead of me a lot of times, right? You get, you get, what's coming. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, wasn't it? Listen to verse 6. This is out of the antediluvian period. If you read 1 through 7, you're going to have Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Three men mentioned out of the old covenant, uh, out of the old uh, antediluvian period. Listen to verse 6. It comes from that period. Because that period is from 1 to 6, uh, 1 to 7. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That was a basic principle doctrine of the antediluvian period. You know how I know it? Because God said, Noah was a man who walked with him. That's a walk of faith. Remember that? Yeah, we studied that. Isn't that good? Listen to Titus 1-2. That's not in your paper. Either. I just, I thought about this stuff when I was coming in. Wrote it down. Titus 1-2. In the hope of eternal life, that's the confident expectation of eternal life. You have it now, you have it forever. That's why it's called eternal. You, you got to get it in this life. You got to get it now. You can't get it later. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. And we've just looked at long ages ago. All right, let's have word prayer and we'll, those who have to go back to work. Father, we're so thankful for these that have studied with us by the word of God today. We've looked at the world from which we came, the antediluvian period and the dramatic changes. I mean, we, I carried in a completed Bible scriptural book, a completed book of the Bible. The scriptures completed. How amazing is that? More amazing than electricity, more amazing than tractors and high machinery they have today where these people can farm thousands of acres is a completed canon of Scripture. The Bible completed only now to be fulfilled. What a joke, Father, to live in the post diluvian period in my lifetime in which that has been done. In my section of life up to now in the antediluvian period, I carry around a completed Bible. What a wonderful thing. Jesus didn't even have a, carry, did, didn't carry a completed Bible. It was Old Covenant. It wasn't a completed Bible. It was a completed Old Covenant. And here I am in the days of the Son of Man carrying a, a completed Bible that tells me everything from the past, present, and future that is ever to be. What a wonderful book. What a wonderful God. Encourage our hearts in it, Father. May we be the people like the antediluvian world that walk by faith faith, not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen.